All right, Marie Hennon, welcome to Breakfast Thank with. Thank you. We're having coffee this morning. What's your usual morning routine? This is it, uh, coffee. One of 10 usually. <laughs> <laughs> so no breakfast in the day? No, I'm not a breakfast gal. All no. right. Do you get up, have your coffee, head out the door, walk the dog? What's your routine? Yeah, get up, grab a coffee, grab a second coffee. <laughs> usually <laughs> grab a third on the way out, get dressed and, and boot off depending on where I am that day. Yeah. You have two dogs yeah, at home? I do, yeah. What, what, are, what breeds are they? What are their names? Well, we've got uh, two dogs. The, um, the English Bulldog's name is Bruno, and uh, he's really my youngest son's dog. And uh, my dog is the Husky, and his name is Scout. Scout, like in To Kill a Mockingbird? Yeah, Scout. Yeah, nice. exactly. People yeah. would find it interesting that Marie Hennon has a Bulldog. Yeah, well, he's, you know, I'm not a Bulldog type person. I'm really a Husky. So we've, we're pretty divided in the family, but my son thinks he's the most beautiful dog in the world, the bulldog. He's got a snaggly tooth, and <laughs> he's, uh, he's great. The husky is yours, though. The husky's mine, yeah, the like husky's mine. Uh, you and I have something in common that we were both born elsewhere, but yeah. raised here from the time we were young. Yeah. Why did your parents choose Canada? Well, you know, at that time, uh, leaving the Middle East, leaving Egypt, uh, there were only a few options uh, available to them. And uh, I think they really wanted to be in North America. And uh, they came to Canada more than once, actually. They came twice. The first time, it didn't quite take. Uh, and the second time, they just felt at home in Toronto in particular because it was um, very cosmopolitan, very multicultural. So. Every immigrant kid mm -hmm. growing up here in Canada has a story of something that happens that shapes them, shapes their identity here. What's that story for you? The thing that shapes my identity in, in Canada in particular? I don't know that there was, honestly, I don't think there was any one thing and I don't think it was one sort of seminal event. Uh, I think really the most significant thing that would have shaped me is that immigrant experience where you have one foot in one place and one foot in the other. And as your family, as you know, is trying to figure it out, because it's all foreign, mm -hmm. um, you're also trying to figure it out. And I, I think you, you definitely see that transition in your life, those phases of those really early years where you know everyone's very confused about what's going on and how to do things. And um, just the transition when I, when I look back, um, that's the most seminal thing, I think, for me that defined, defined me. When you look at you in law school, uh, you told your friends, I'm going to work for Edward Greenspan <laughs> yeah. because he is the best. Right. Fast forward, you become a law partner with him. He becomes yeah. your mentor. Mm -hmm. You were living that life. Is yeah. it what you imagined it would be? It was exactly what I imagined it would be. It was incredible. Uh, you know, I was always so committed uh, to this profession. I was obsessed. Uh, I still am. And I just wanted to learn from the best, and, and he was. He was, it was one-on-one -on -one mentoring. I, I uh, don't think I'd be the lawyer that I am today without him and without Mark Rosenberg, his partner, who ultimately became a judge of the Court of Appeal. Uh, I just was eating this 24-7 and uh, doing it literally 24-7, <laughs> and I loved it. I, I just loved it. it. It opened up everything, and it was exactly, exactly what I thought it would be. What did you learn, not necessarily... Well, actually, tell me both. What did he teach you, and what did you learn from watching him? I, from watching him, I learned uh, that the the story, the the narrative, um, is very important, and you have to be a lover of facts. You know, when I came into it, I really loved law. I loved the theory of law. I loved I loved the the more esoteric stuff, and so I thought the facts were were just getting in the way. But it's about people, and it's about developing that narrative. And he really was very, very good at that and very focused on that. So that required a lot of patience. Uh, and that's, I think, what I learned um, very significantly from him. Patience. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Is there anything he told you, any phrase he gave you, anything that sticks with you? The, well, no, the thing I think that stuck with me the most and has really been seminal uh, for me is he had an uncompromising, unwavering commitment to the client. That was your focus and your job and he just never wavered from that no matter how tough the case was, no matter how difficult the client was, no matter what uh, the public view was. It was a real commitment to the job of being a defense lawyer, of what we did and where our place was in the system. And he was uncompromising about it, uh, really, really uncompromising and tough. 
-hmm. And I think when you're a young lawyer, sometimes, you know, you uh, don't necessarily see it that clearly. And mm -hmm. he really, really impressed that on me. And what I can say is that whenever I found myself in um, situations that can feel slightly overwhelming, I do think back to that, because if he was here, he'd say, suck it up, toughen up. Uh, and so I, I, I took that with me, and it stays with me to this day. Who do you go to now for advice, now that he's gone? Well, it, it's interesting. I think criminal lawyers actually uh, go to, to each other all the time. Hmm. Uh, and what's really funny about it, I don't know if you find this in your profession, is that as you get older, you learn more that you can't assume anything and mm -hmm. so that you tend to be more open to other people's advice and so you'll see senior lawyers tend to collaborate a lot more actually than the very young ones that's something that comes with uh, with age so uh, of course my partners I, I go to them a lot and a lot of people in my in my legal community when I want to work something through uh, you have been described as a shark <laughs> uh, you have been described, this is by your clients, uh, Michael yeah. Bryant said that you channeled Hannibal Lecter. Right. Uh, how would you describe yourself? Oh, maybe that was the day I didn't have coffee in the morning. <laughs> um, I, I would describe myself as tough, um, controlled, uh, in control, uh, deliberate, thoughtful in the sense of thinking through what it is that I'm doing. Uh, it's not reflexive. That's how I would describe myself. Uh, the impression you leave on people, especially recently in your career, is a big one. I remember speaking to a Globe and Mail reporter after watching the press conference you gave mm -hmm. with Vice Admiral Norman. Mm -hmm. And she came and she said, she is so bold and so confident. She is rock star. <laughs> Do you realize that you have this impression on people that your naked no. confidence leaves a big impact? No, I find that actually very odd. Um, it's great. I love it. Uh, but I think, you know, part of it is just as you get older and being female as well, you know, you really come to the realization that you will never fit what everyone's ideal of what you should be is, right? So if you're too aggressive, uh, you're too aggressive. If you're not aggressive enough, if you're this or that, I mean, you never quite fit. And I think um, the one thing that certainly I had a bit of, but definitely developed more, is that this is it, like this is how I come, you know, and I'm good with that, I'm totally fine with that. That doesn't mean I'm perfect, there are a million and one flaws, um, but I'm fine with it. And I think for women in particular, um, being comfortable in your own skin, just sort of settling in and being okay that not everybody approves of you is something that comes a little bit with maturity and I think that's the confidence that, that you're, you're seeing. It's that. But it's also seeing a woman who does not feel like she needs to apologize for what she's saying. And you don't see that all the time with women. Right. They don't always speak with that authority. There's always that tone that says, I'm a, somebody's going to question what I have to say, right. so I'm going to have to have something else. You don't have that. Yeah, you know, that's, I, I get that. And I, I talk to a lot of young women uh, about having that self-confidence. I, I got to say, a lot of it is a bit of an accident because of who I was surrounded by. You know, my mom has always been... Um, very committed to me being unapologetic about what I do, what my choices are in life, what my career choice is, about the fact that I, I wanted a, a career. And then, you know, when I worked with Eddie, he never, ever tried to tone me down, never sort of said, sit down, stand back, mm -hmm. any of that, you know, the tougher, the better for him. So I think that I either surrounded myself with or was fortunate enough to have people in my life that never tried to sort of sand off what, what the edges are. But this mm. is it. I mean, it's not, this is what I am. I, I, if I tried to be warm and fuzzy, I couldn't. It's just not the way I'm made. Which doesn't mean being warm and fuzzy is, is, is not um, effective, particularly in a criminal context or in a, uh, in a law context. I just think you have to be who you are. So that's, that's it. Like, this is, this is what I am. Does, does your impression that you leave on people matter to you? My impression that I leave on, uh, on young women is very important to, to me, obviously, and to young lawyers. I, I think that is important. The impression that I leave on the public of what it is our job is as lawyers and what the justice system is about is, is deeply meaningful to me because it's not like TV. 
Uh, and I want people to have an understanding of it and have respect for it and be proud of it in Canada. I think that's very, very important to me. So I think in those areas, uh, yes, that, that is meaningful to me that uh, at least I try to either explain or, or set an example. Looking back over your cases, what was your toughest loss? What's the one that bothered you the most? Every loss. There, there isn't a single loss that um, doesn't bother me. Uh, you know, you are there and you have a very specific obligation to, to help your client through. And so every loss, uh, you know, there are years later, it is not unusual where I will be sitting down and debriefing again saying, you know, do you think I should have? Hmm. Uh, I just never let it go. I, you know, the wins are easy. They sort of come and um, they're, they're done. But the losses for me are uh, very difficult. And it's because... I constantly reassess whether I should have done something different, I should have asked a different question, you know, should I have structured it differently. I, I find that very hard to let go of. And I'm not kidding. Years later, I force people in my office to sit down and go, okay, no, let's replay that again. Uh, do you think? I just can't, can't let it go. Uh, so going back then, taking a look at a case you worked on with Edward Greetsman, the Robert Latimer case, Supreme Court of Canada ruled against. Right. You said you prepared the factums on that case. Yeah. What bothers you about that and what did you learn? Because I imagine you look for the lesson in your losses. Uh, well, that was a, a devastating case because uh, he's quite an extraordinary uh, person and it was tragic all around. And I think, you know, as often happens, what you were reading were really snippets of, of things in the headlines, but really didn't have an understanding of who he was, which was an, a very, very committed, loving family. That's who they were, and they uh, suffered greatly. Uh, so I, I don't know that I learned a, a lesson from it. I found it uh, very difficult, and I had hoped perhaps that more uh, compassion would have been uh, extended to him. I, I think you know people sort of lined up on either side mm -hmm. of a, a debate and forgot that this was a real person and a real father and a real mother and a real child and a lot of pain. Is there anything that you wish you could go back and do differently? Not just with that case, mm. and anything. Yeah, I think I would have liked to have a little more fun and been a little less serious <laughs> when I was uh, younger. I was always uh, very serious, and um, I think I, you know, I would have liked to have... Uh, been a little more lighthearted when I was younger. Would you still have been this successful? I don't know. That's a good question. I don't know. I guess sort of being single-minded is part of the drill. There's pros and cons. What would you consider your biggest triumph? I think the most... I, I wouldn't characterize it as a triumph. I think the most meaningful thing for me, and part of it is because of that immigrant experience, right, that stays with you throughout, and the, the, the wondering whether you are viewed as being accepted is that um, when members of the public have talked to me and said, you know, thanks for explaining the justice system, or you represent it well, and then they follow it up by saying you are a true Canadian. Uh, that is just phenomenal to me. It really is. It's, uh, I can't express how meaningful it is, unless you, like me, ha remember, you know, not speaking the language and your family not speaking the language and all of that, and then to be looked at. Uh, I can tell you that I, I, my parents and I sit down and talk about it, and I say, you know, th this is what's said. Can you believe it? It's very, very uh, meaningful to me. It really is. I find that's why terms like old stock are painful. Yeah. When you hear them come from political leaders. Yeah. Because it says you are, but you aren't. Yeah, yeah, that's right. That's right. And I think as a, you know, as a young woman who is obviously not from here, I mean, mm -hmm. you know the feeling, right? You can, yeah. you can tell. Um, it, it, you are always sort of searching for that, uh, for that right place. And so that, for me, it, it is not a triumph, but the most meaningful thing to me is, is that that feeling that you're viewed as having participated in this country uh, and that even the old stock thinks you've made a contribution, which uh, is something else. Plus, you admired Edward Greenspan, one mm -hmm. of the most influential lawyers in the country. People mm -hmm. would say, that's, that's you now. It was never the plan, but <laughs> it was never it's amazing. the plan. Yeah, no. It was never the plan to be the best. It was the plan to be the best at what I did, uh, which is very different than being well known for it. Um, it was always my plan to 
work as hard as I could and to push myself, and I still do. I, I mean, I still always want to do something different, see what I can do better, just because I, I love this work. Yeah. Um, that was the plan, but the rest of it, you can't predict. People see you as fearless, but is there anything that you're afraid of, or anything that makes you nervous? Sharks make me nervous. Sharks make you nervous? <laughs> yes, I You've was... been called a shark yeah, probably well, twice. Sharks, sharks make me nervous. Um, no, what am I, I don't, you know, it's interesting. Someone else asked me that recently, you know, what are you afraid of? And I, I think I don't, I just don't think of the world largely in that way. I, I don't think of things in terms of being afraid of them, maybe because I know you do stuff and you can succeed and then you can fail. Um, I, I don't, I just don't calibrate my life that way. I just don't think about it. And I don't walk through the world thinking of it, which right. doesn't mean we don't have those moments, right? Obviously you fear losing people that you love and, and that sort of stuff. But when it comes to sort of every day, what we do, you know, I, I just never think of my life in that way. I mean, so what? You try and you, and you fail. I mean, it sucks. You feel lousy. You will survive it. There, yeah. So I just, I don't, I don't know. It's, it's not the way I walk through the world, I think. How do some of the cases that you've worked on, the people that you've met, how do they inform how you parent or the choices you make at home? I don't know. I think I'd, I try to keep that as, as, as uh, separate as conceivably possible. But, you know, if, you're, if your parent is a doctor mm -hmm. uh, and they treat something, they're always going to want to make sure you're okay. I mean, I, I, I don't know. I, I, I do my best to try to keep those things separate. How do you do that? Because speaking with, you know, police officers, officers for example, they see and witness firsthand the worst of the worst that people can do to each other. Right. It informs how they watch their kids, whether or not their kids do sleepovers. Uh, you know, working in news, you see a lot of the same, yeah. sort of the good and the bad. And yeah, that informs some of the choices that I make when I'm parenting. Well, so you meet, you know, the people that you meet, the cases that you've worked on. How do you separate it? I have a very balanced husband, fortunately. <laughs> Maybe that's the answer. A good partner. Yeah. yeah. So when you're working on a case and you come home, you're in the office and then you come home, where does that separation happen for you? I think of the case of David Frost, for example. You have two kids at home, you're working on one case, and then you go home and you see them and they're at home. So where do you, where do you, where do you, where do you leave that? I don't know, but as I said, I'm not going to talk about my cases because uh, sure. I think it's, it's really, um, those people have been through quite a bit and it's their journey to talk about, so I don't really love sort of, I, I find that entire um, relationship with a client deeply personal. I really do. And um, in the same way that, you know, if you can imagine going to a doctor and then your doctor saying, you know, when I saw her and I was examining her, it's a, it's a really difficult time for people. And uh, so I always like to sort of leave that to them. If they want to tell that story, it's their story to tell, not mine. You make that comparison a lot between the law for you yeah. and medicine. Yeah. Tell me about the parallel you see. Well, I think because you're dealing with people in times of crisis, um, hmm. and you're dealing with people in a time that they're they're feeling at a loss and distressed and out of their element, really, because it is a foreign language that you're dealing with in a criminal system. There's an enormous loss of control uh, for anyone who goes through the process. You sit in court, you generally don't say anything. You know, your lawyers are are doing everything and, and so when you you do it as I have for 26 years you really see the profound and permanent impact like it's not just I think people think well you go through the system and that's a lesson and they think it's just talk it is not people never come out of the other side uh, feeling necessarily whole uh, and without mm. without scars it is a very very overwhelming process to go through and I guess that's why I, I compare it to that because, you know, in that case, when you're with a dealing with a health crisis, it's the same thing. You don't know, right? You're, yeah. you're relying on someone to help you navigate it, and you really um, have to put your faith in them. So that's what I think it is. But I, I do think it's, um, it's very, very hard and very difficult for everybody th that is involved in the process. And I just think those are their stories to tell, not mine.
Are you in contact still with any past clients? Because you've had that personal relationship, you've come through the other side sometimes, with them? Sometimes they don't even want to acknowledge you because they've had it. Huh. Um, they've just had it. They don't want to relive this chapter of their life. Uh, so, you know, it happens. You'll meet people in public and, and they don't, uh, they, they just don't want to be remembered. You, you know, most criminal lawyers know not to go up to former clients and say, hey, how are you? Interesting. Oh, even yeah. going through all of that personal... Sure, because they don't, sort of. you know, they don't want to share it. They don't want to relive it. Um, some people don't know about it. It is it is really a difficult process. And, uh, you know, it, it takes a lot to get through. Do you ever turn down a client? Yeah, I do. I do. Um, you know, I'm, I'm very fortunate that I can choose a little bit more. Uh, but, you know, the, the main thing is not, it's not based on what you are charged with. Uh, obviously, you know, when people come to me, they're not coming for my moral assessment of their character. Right. I have a very particular function. Um, but if I find uh, a client who comes in and thinks that your job is simply to go out there and be a mouthpiece and to uh, not conduct yourself professionally, that sort of um, behavior, I will not act for a client like that. That's just not, it's not something I'm interested in. Uh, your fee has been reported, you know, clients spending up to $300,000, $200,000. For most people, that is an astronomical number. Um, what does that get you? If I'm going to hire, or if I'm going to go to Marie Hennon, she's going to take me on as a client, and I'm going to pay that kind of money what does that service entail? Well, first of all, let me just say that there are uh, a lot of lawyers uh, in this country who are uh, incredible lawyers, uh, and their fees aren't uh, that high. So you can get a lot of great representation. We're very fortunate, uh, obviously, with the cutbacks in legal aid that uh, really undermines the ability of people to get lawyers who can, um, who can assist them and who are very good and qualified at what they do. Um, but what it gets you, I think, as in any other business or any other profession, is 26 years of experience and uh, a whole team, a phenomenal team of people that uh, work with me and, and a lot of brain trust there that is uh, in my office. Uh, so, you know, I, I think that's largely why uh, people will come and they want when you're you've got everything on the line they want to feel like they've done everything they can to help themselves so i want to pull back the curtain a little bit because for oh no most yes <laughs> most people uh, that wasn't part of the deal don't walk into you know a criminal lawyer's office so when you walk in and you're going to marie hedden um do you, you know, does your firm hire private investigators? Do you, is there a whole team of people that's just responsible for data research and, and emails? What does, what does that mean? I mean, most of us only have access to no, TV. No, it's not like, it's, it, well, it's not like TV, actually. It's not like TV. It's a grind. It's a, it's really hard work. Uh, so you may see the last hour or two of what is months and months and months and months of exhausting, really super boring work. Uh, so it's detailed work. It is investigation. It's not like you hire private investigators. You go, okay, go out there and, you know, it's just not, it's not CSI. It's just nose to the grindstone, working through lots of documents, lots of reading, lots of interviewing, and going through the same thing over and over and over and over again until you get to a place where you see what it is that you're going to be doing and how you're going to, how you're going to be dealing with this, this particular case. What I love about looking through your cases is that you, you love the law, you use the law to win your cases. Most lawyers do that, but you have this ability to see where to press for advantage. Mm -hmm. Did you learn that, or is that instinct? No, I think, you know, again, I think in every business, right, as in yours, a lot of it you can learn, and then there's a component that is instinct. Yeah. And you're going to bring your perspective to it, and your your feel for a, a case, and, and I think that's, that's obviously what I hope I bring to it. Uh, but yeah, part of it is instinct, and that's true even when you're in court. Is there a case out there right now in the public that you wish you could get your hands on? No, I would have liked to have defended Martha Stewart. That would have been fun. <laughs> um, no, there's nothing right now that's, uh, that's got my attention. Uh, there's a case that I look at in the headlines, and I think, what would Marie Hennon do with the case? And that's for missing and murdered uh, Indigenous women and girls. Yeah. 
I would yeah. love to see you tackle a case like that. Well, I, I would love to be representative of, of those indigenous women um, because that requires us to take a hard look at how things are done. And of course, we have this report now um, in terms of policing, in terms of uh, very significant social and economic issues, uh, in terms of biases that are in the system. Um, that, that is an area that is obviously, I'm glad that we are looking uh, and uh, trying to see what we can do better uh, because it's a national tragedy. It really is a national tragedy. It's wrong. It's wrong and it's heartbreaking. It's very heartbreaking to me. I think one of the things that uh, we often see, and it, it, you will, if you're in my office, see me rail about this, is that you know what's on the front page isn't necessarily the thing that should be uh, getting attention when you know that same week an indigenous young woman is found in a dumpster up north and that's on what page 25 mm -hmm. um, because what I don't know I mean that maybe you guys can answer that question for me but we need to bring attention not only to the things that are you know being tweeted about but the things that are genuinely important that is one of them that is a, a very significant problem and missing and murdered is a component but if you look at the indigenous community and how they are dealt with in the criminal system both as victims and accused it is shocking and appalling and we should be doing much better you have said you wish people I'm gonna read this you wish people would do their jobs without fear of not being liked mm hmm what does that mean well I, I think you have to um, in a criminal context in particular, everyone needs to be focused on the one thing that it is our job to do, which as a criminal lawyer it's to defend the person, uh, a prosecutor is to prosecute, the judge is to j decide, but it all should be done, I think, impartially and objectively. And sometimes that's hard to do. It's very hard to do when we're in the age of social media and, um, and Twitter and things being very immediate. Uh, to remove yourself from that and be principled. But that is your obligation, right? That is your obligation, that you have to remove yourself from all of it. Which doesn't mean be tone deaf, because our system has to improve, it has to be current and all of that. Uh, but what it cannot do, what it can never do, is capitulate to mob rule or the, just the will of the majority. That is not um, something that should ever infect our, our justice system. And it really, by and large, doesn't in this, in this country. We are very lucky. We don't have elected judges. We don't have elected prosecutors who are running for office based on how many convictions they have. We have a very good system. And we as Canadians should be proud of it. We really should. It's not perfect. No, it's, nothing's perfect. Who's perfect? What's perfect? Uh, and you are always assessing, and you're always improving, and you're always rethinking. But you don't tear down the foundation when you, you've got something that's pretty solid. You yeah. build on it. If a young woman were to take that advice, to do your job without fear of being like, is it realistic for everybody to be able to say, well, you know, like I'm, I'm 28, I need some people to like me in order to advance? Yeah, I, I think where what I was trying to say, maybe uh, if not particularly elegantly, is that that can't be your, your prime objective because you will never be in a position where you're going to satisfy everybody. But there is no question that, you know, in my job as well, if, if you're not um, liked enough to be listened to, uh, then people turn off. They don't want to be persuaded by you. So you don't walk around, contrary to Hannibal Lecter and Shark, that is actually not how you persuade people. Because if you and I are having a discussion, the only way I'm going to get you to listen to me is to make you want to listen to me. And so conversation is, is probably the most important thing. And, and dialogue so that people are interested enough or have confidence enough that they want to hear you out. So I think that is important, but being everyone's best friend, being, you know, approved of is just never going to happen, right? It's, it's an never interesting happen. distinction. Yeah. Yeah, and and I think for young women who find themselves in in out there in the world, there is so much stress on them to to be liked and to be affable and, and not to ruffle any feathers and, and not to, it's impossible, it's an impossible standard. I mean, uh, it's just impossible to impose that on women and to think that they're going to be able to be themselves and, and to succeed. So I think when I'm saying that, it's really 
more about just being comfortable in your own skin. It's not walking around and offending everyone you talk to because that's, <laughs> that's not going to work. Is there some, what is it that people get wrong about you? An assumption they make that's probably not true. Well, I think people get lots of things wrong about me. I think like they what? don't. I think their perception, this sort of Hannibal Lecter shark, is is not what I do. Um, it's much more um, thoughtful and controlled and 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 deliberate within um, the parameters of our system. So it's not like TV. I think that is a very significant thing that uh, people get wrong. It's very caricature-y. Um, I think people get wrong that you know, as a woman, that you, there's only one dimension to you. So, you know, you're either a, a tough bitch or you're not. And we have no shades <laughs> and no components to us, which is just silly. Um, but I get it. I get it because I, I, people sort of project and, and um, are seeing only one facet of you. You know, and I, I understand that. And that can serve you well, right, for people to, to see Marie, Marie Hannon and think shark. That works well. well I don't learn. think actually people in my profession and, and the prosecutors and judges that I deal with see that. I think they see that you're uh, hardworking for mm -hmm. sure, that you come in prepared, that you're tough, uh, and that you you know hopefully you you know what you're doing. I, you're not going to terrorize your way to wins. That's just silly. That's that's silly TV stuff. It's just not the way the world works. And. Uh, Nobody's afraid in our system, I can assure you, they're all pretty tough. Um, and so they just expect that they're dealing with somebody who is working awfully hard. Uh, some people have described you as cold, does that fit? As cold. <laughs> I don't know, who described me as cold? Um, probably reserved uh, in that way. I, I don't think my uh, friends hopefully don't think I'm, I'm cold. I'm tough. There is no question about that. That is just, the, that's just the way I'm made. Uh, it's not put on. Um, but I, uh, I don't know that, I guess sometimes I can be. I can be cold. I can be reserved. Uh, how many hours a week do you work? It depends. Depends on what I'm working on. If, if you know, I'm in, uh, working up to a trial, it's 24-7, it's weekends, uh, and when I don't have a busy schedule, then you uh, you take a breather. So it, it goes yes. up and down, and as you get older, you just have more control over your schedule. Uh, your image has changed a lot since <laughs> 2002. Your, your, your appearance, your yeah. image. Um, when someone changes their image, it means something. And someone like you, who is meticulous, yeah. very aware of every decision and every right. choice, yeah. what why the change in image? Well, that's wrong, actually. There's, there's no change in image. But do you look the same that you looked as when you were 12 or 14 or 20? No. No. Right. Um, straightening irons were invented, which was awesome. <laughs> I, you know, that was a big deal for me because I couldn't manage curly hair. But I've been a fashion victim since I was tiny. Like, this is the thing. My, my family owned a, a clothing store. Yeah. My grandmother was a seamstress. Uh, my mom always believed in dressing and dressing to the... Like, we are a, a family of fashion victims. Uh, so it's not new. I think I just got better at it. Um, you know, you get older and you're, you're able to, to do a little bit better and more. And you probably... Uh, you know, I, I need to spend a heck of a lot more time now, unfortunately. Um, so it, it's, there's no image makeover. Uh, if anything, it's really quite restrained because I'm in a business that's very professional and you're representing your clients. So, you know, you can't come in with uh, piercings and tattoos all over the place, which, you know, if, it, if I had my druthers, uh, I'd be as punky as they could be, you could come. So you would? No, oh, for sure. I was uh, an absolute goth in, in, uh, in uh, high school. That's, you were a goth? Yeah, yeah, for sure. I love that. I, I mean, I'm, I'm, that's where I skew. So, but you're in an environment where you are representing people and it's not about you, it's actually about them, and you have to be professional. So actually, contrary to, I think, what people think, it's not an image makeover. It's a lot of restraint on my part. So Marie Hennon with a goth. Yeah. I feel like that's going to be the headline you that think comes so? out of our breakfast. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that and the glitter and the, yeah, all of it. Uh, you have said that you've known since the seventh grade yeah. you wanted to be a lawyer. Yeah. If for whatever reason that hadn't worked out, yeah. what was plan B? Oh, my gosh. You know, I think medicine was in, in the running for sure for me. Uh, I would have a love of architecture, and that would have been 
you know, something I, I really I admire architects and, and what they create. Uh, that would be there. But, you know, I, I don't know. I don't know. You just always knew this was, this was where it you was, went. It was, I love the work. I love what I'm thinking about, what I get to think about every day. I love the fact that it actually affects our lives. You know, constitutional rights affect how we live. Yeah. Uh, and what our expectations are of our government. I love all that. But the other part, to be honest, is I love how you do your job every day. I get to be in court. I love advocacy. I love litigation. I mean, that's my nature. I like a good fight. It's who I am. And so, you know, the idea that I would be constrained behind a desk all day was something that, that would have been tough for me. Yeah. Um, if Marie Hannon was a goth, what do you listen to in your car? When you're away from oh everybody and you can feed your own brain what you want, what do you listen to? <laughs> I listen to a lot of rap music. No, you do not. I do. I love it. Like I love it. If I'm at home cooking, that's, what I'm, that's what's on. Rap caviar. Yeah. Yeah, I do. I love it. Uh, you are a lawyer. Yeah. Your husband is a lawyer. Yeah. Your brother is a lawyer. Yeah. But he was a stand-up comic for six years, so he sort of came <laughs> through it circuitously. But yes. Uh, are there plans for your kids to be lawyers? Who knows? Do you uh, care? Who knows? Oh, yeah. I I'm an immigrant. For, you know, <laughs> there's only very few options for Doctor, immigrant. lawyer, <laughs> engineer. It. That's it. That's the three. Yeah. That's absolutely the three. Those are three options. And I think I railed against it when I was younger. I was like, come on, there's so much stuff. But who, like the seeds get planted when you're little. Do you do this to your kids? Do you? Yes. Or if they come to me and say, I want to be a yeah. journalist, I'm like, well, you know, there's what other. This? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So, uh, what does a day off look like for you? Oh my gosh, a day off. Um, you know, what do I like to do? I, you know, there is no. My my, my partner uh, Danielle says that she has never seen someone's IQ drop as quickly as when I walk into a clothing store, where I am stunned by the newest shade of yellow. But you season. love fashion. I do. I love it. I'm. Compl I'm seriously. A fashion victim. I, I, you know, I, I give her a running commentary. I'll send emails to my friends saying, "Here are your must-haves for the season." Um, so I, I love it. I love the the artistry of it. Actually, I really do. I, um, I think it's very, very creative. Um, so you know, I I could spend years in a store. Uh, that would be very easy. I love art galleries. I love art. Um, you know, hang out with friends. Normal human things, not shark things. Wait. <laughs> I'm not sitting there, you know, waving my tail, just waiting. I, I, I go out and do things like other people. What are your friends like about you? Oh, my gosh. You'd have to ask them, but probably um, my loyalty. Yeah. I mean, I'm lucky. I have these extraordinary women uh, around me my whole life. Uh, and... Uh, I've been very lucky. Yeah. One of those women being your mom. Mm -hmm. You share this great story about how when asked, when you were getting married, you yeah. were shopping for a wedding dress, mm. and they said, oh, you must be so proud. Yeah. Share with us the answer that your mom gave. Uh, she said, uh, I'm not proud because my daughter's getting married. I was proud when she graduated from law school and even more proud when she got her master's degree. It's nice that she's getting married, but that's not why I'm proud of her. And that was the mic drop. I, <laughs> but I knew, like, when the woman said, oh, you're... But she also said, you know, she's like a princess. Aren't you proud of your daughter? I just thought, oh, my God, don't, don't, don't do that. Don't say that to my mom. She just, that is, you know, that was never her thing. That was, because she came from a culture where that was uh, such a priority. That was the function of, mm. of, for sure, for her, that you had to get married. Um, and she just really, I think, to be honest, just resented having that put on her. And so it was just never part of my life. And it's never been her assessment of me, right, as a woman. That was not the value assessment that, you know, you sort of check these boxes. Uh, so, yeah, that was definitely the wrong thing to say to her. I've read that you love the law so much. You love legal books and you I, love yeah. legal dramas, yeah. as do I. So yeah. what's your favorite law show? I, I don't think there's one that I have... Um, watch that I don't love. I mean, you know, I, I, you name it. I'm just a junkie. But I have to say I'm, I'm mostly hung up on the documentaries right now. Mm -hmm. um, so Which The Making ones? of a Murderer I loved. I thought that was great because you saw both one and two. You saw sort of the inner workings of yeah, it. Yeah, process. Yeah. Currently, When They See Us um, yeah. is not a documentary, but based on the, the exonerated Central Park Five, uh, I think is fascinating because it really shows uh, members of the public 
what goes on and what, what went on. Uh, I think it's an important thing for people to see. Uh, and that's a, a case that caused a lot of people to get very angry and wanting someone on the chopping block. And they had, you know, a bunch of young kids. That's who was put on that. So anything related to that, I, I just... You were recently asked about entering politics. Oh, right. Yes, and you said, I can't see the day a 53, almost 54-year-old <laughs> Arab-Canadian female is going to be elected. Right. Why not? I just don't think it's, it's a realistic thing and, and well, why well you're you know, strong you're smart your people have said they've defined you as a Canadian why not I just I don't know I, I just don't think I, I would be uh, a particularly electable uh, person but here's the thing I do know there are numerous women out there that are electable and I really really am desperate truly desperate for the day uh, that we have a, a female leader in this country I, I it cannot come fast enough it's important for women in this country and young women to see it, uh, and it's important for the world to see it. And it stuns me that, you know, in, in North America, uh, that seems to be an elusive goal. That has to happen. In the same way, though, that you stood up and said, when you were criticized uh, post Gomeshi case for you know, working against women, and you stood up and said, I would be letting down women if mm -hmm. I did not do the best mm -hmm. job mm -hmm. possible. Mm -hmm. Could you maybe be the leader that people are waiting to see, the one that you're waiting to see? I, 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 don't, I, I have to tell you, no, I, I don't know. I don't, uh, I, I don't know that that would be uh, where I want to be or where I think I would serve um, the best. And I actually do believe, I know this is crazy because if you look at the states in particular, uh, the theory that you're actually qualified for the job that you do seems to be a strike against you. But I actually think you should know what you're doing. Like, you should spend your life, and there are people that have spent their life in government and understand how it works and um, are completely capable. So I think we've got a good field. I, we just got to get them up there and noticed. All right, Marie, thanks very much. Thank you. We'll see what happens down the road. Yeah. <laughs> Minister or not. <laughs> <laughs> to be continued. To be continued. Thanks for watching. If you like this, be sure to subscribe here. And you can check out more Your Morning videos right here.